everyone, it's Katie with Rosie Riveters, and I am here for this week's Rosie Reads. And this week in all our online content, from Snack Time Science to Rosie Makes to today, Rosie Reads, we are talking about conservation and natural resources and the earth. And today's book is I Am Jane Goodall by Brad Meltzer and illustrated by Christopher Eliopoulos. And this book is a biography, and we've talked about biographies before, and that means that it's a book about a real person. So Jane Goodall is a real person, and she's alive today, and she's a world-renowned conservationist, and a UN special messenger for peace, and a primatologist. Now, a primatologist is a scientist who studies primates, and for Jane in particular, she studied chimpanzees. And we're going to learn all about it in this book. And as always, I want you to do two things while we're reading. Um, you'll need a pencil and a piece of paper, and I want you to write down all of Jane's amazing discoveries about chimpanzees. She really changed the way we think about animals and what they do and what they're capable of. So she did remarkable things with chimpanzees. And the other thing I want you to do is start thinking about how you can build a bridge. They talk about this in the book a lot. How you can make a community, help each other, and help the earth. And we'll talk about that more when we get to the end. But let's get started with I Am Jane Goodall. I Am Jane Goodall. On my first birthday, my father brought me a cuddly toy chimpanzee named Jubilee. Jubilee, meet Jane. I love Jubilee. I mean it. Loved. I used to carry Jubilee with me everywhere. As I got older, when I'd line up all my toys and play teacher, Jubilee was the one who had his own chair. Okay, class, now who knows what rabbits like to eat? Yes, Jubilee? Correct as always. And who knows what rabbits like to eat? I didn't just love my toy chimpanzee though. I loved all animals, even the earthworms I found in the garden. Your mom says, did you bring the earthworms inside the house? Don't worry, mom, they're as safe as can be. Right under my pillow. <laughs> what would your mom do if you brought earthworms into the house? My mom told me the worms would probably be safer in the garden, so we took them outside and buried them back in their home. At five years old, I was curious to learn how chickens lay eggs, so I crawled into my grandmother's hen house to watch. At first, all the hens were scared of me. Then I decided to crouch in the corner. If I moved, the hens would have run away. I was patient, though. Finally, after all the hours of waiting, I saw what I was looking for. The hen gave a little wigger, wiggle and plop, there was an egg. Where were you? asked her mom. You've been missing for so long we sat on a search party. You'll never believe where eggs come from. It was my first research project. In addition to animals, I also love nature. I named the chestnut tree Nookie and the beech tree Beech. Beech was my favorite. Thank you, Beech, for letting me read up here. Oh, that was another thing I loved, reading. Back then, my family didn't have a lot of money. To get books, we went to the library. When I was seven years old, I got a book that would change my life. It was called The Story of Dr. Doolittle. I read it once, then read it again, then read it a third time before it had to go back to the library. It was about a man who could talk to animals. In the book, there's a parrot who says that if you want to learn how animals talk, you need the power of observation. But what I remember most is the part where Dr. Doolittle and his animal friends are being chased and they come to a cliff. How are we ever going to get across? That's one of the animals saying it. A bridge, quick, make a bridge. Right there, the monkeys joined hands and feet. They became the bridge. Isn't that beautiful? We can accomplish anything by working together. After reading that book, I vowed that I would go to Africa and live among the animals. By the time I was 12, I had my own nature group, the Alligator Club. My friends and I raised money to help old horses. We took nature walks and wrote down what we saw, or at least I did. And if you wanted to have a high rank in the club, and here she's talking to all her friends, 
you have to be able to recognize 10 dogs, 10 birds, 10 trees, and five butterflies or moths. How about I go first? Something tells me she's going to name them all perfectly. Each of us even had our own animal name. Jane was the Red Admirable, named after a beautiful butterfly. Was I the best student? Not really. On school days, it was hard for me to wake up. I didn't like being indoors. But if we were outside or there were animals around, that's when I got excited. Guess how many pets I had? There was a lizard with no legs named Ivor, guinea pigs named Gandhi and Jimmy, racing snails with numbers painted on them, Pickles the cat, Hamlet the hamster, and Peter the canary. And that doesn't include the dogs I looked after, like my favorite Rusty, who liked wearing pajamas. Woof, that means he likes pajamas. I wanted a job where I could learn more about animals. But back then, if you were a girl, people didn't think you could become a scientist. They expected girls to become nurses, secretaries, or teachers. I wanted to go to Africa. I wanted to study animals. Luckily, my mom always told me, if you really want something, work hard for it. If you don't give up, you'll find a way. I never forgot that. Soon I had my chance. One of my school friends invited me to visit her family in Kenya. That's right, in Africa. To pay for the trip, I worked as a waitress and hid my money under the carpet. One day I closed the curtains, counted it all, and I've got enough. I'm going to Africa. She's so excited. The trip took 21 days by boat. I was 23 years old. It all seemed like a dream until I saw a giraffe who stared directly at me. It had dark eyes, long lashes, a black tongue, and was chewing acacia thorns. I knew my dream was coming alive. Finally, I was in the Africa of Dr. Doolittle. Two months later, my life changed again. Someone told me, if you are interested in animals, you must meet Dr. Lewis Leakey. Nice to meet you. I'm Jane Goodall. I hear you like animals. You have no idea. Dr. Leakey was an anthropologist which means he studied how humans live, and also a paleontologist, which means he studied fossils and bones. At first, he hired me as a secretary, but he was quickly impressed with what I knew about animals, including his own pets. Eventually, Dr. Leakey told me about a new job studying chimpanzees up close. He said going into the forest would be hard. It would be dangerous. But if we could find out how chimps live today, we'd learn more about how our own prehistoric ancestors used to live. I have no college degree, says Jane, no training and no experience, but I want that job. Jane, I've been waiting for you to say that, says Dr. Leakey. For a year, I read everything I could about chimpanzees. They're always observed in a lab. No one had studied them in the jungle where they actually live. I was also told that women couldn't be alone in the forest. They said I needed a guide plus a companion. My mom offered to come. I was ready. I knew you wouldn't give up, says her mom. I'll never forget the day, July 16, 1960, the day I first set foot in what is today Gombe National Park in Tanzania, Africa. At 26 years old, I had finally made it to the home of chimpanzees. It was a place that would change my life. During one of my first explorations, we saw two chimpanzees eating in a tall tree. They noticed us, they noticed us and ran away. They're scared of us, says Jane. The next day, we didn't see any chimps. There are no chimps the day after that either. For months, I tried to get close, but they kept running away. Then I started going alone, just me. I'd go to a high area called the peak and look down with my binoculars. This was my secret. Be patient, learn about how they lived, slowly move closer and closer. In time, I saw that the chimpanzees would hang out in groups of six or fewer. The female chimps would be with the children. The male chimps would be with one another. These weren't mindless animals. This was a community.
still, it took nearly a year before I could get within 100 yards of the chimpanzees. One day, I came back to camp and found out one of the male chimpanzees took our food, including your bananas. Fantastic, says Jane. That means they're not scared of me now. I bet he'll be back tomorrow. The next day I waited and waited. There were no chimpanzees in sight. Then at 4 p.m. I heard a rustling noise by my tent. It was the large male chimpanzee with a thick beard, David Graybeard. That was the name I gave him. Back then, people told me there was a certain way to study animals, that I shouldn't give the chimpanzees names. They said animals were supposed to have numbers, not names. Why? They thought animals didn't have personalities or emotions. They thought that if we gave them names, we'd start pretending they were like us. But that's what no one realized. They were like us. That day, David Graybeard took my nuts and my bananas. A month later, he took one from my hand. Even later, out in the forest, he slowly approached me and checked to see if I had a banana in my pocket. It was one of my proudest moments having the other chimpanzees now understand that I wasn't a threat. I was their friend, and they were mine. Over time, by seeing the chimpanzees as individuals, I could truly understand them. Who wants another banana? David was calm, though he liked getting what he wanted. It's okay, pal, calm down. Goliath was easily excited. William was shy. Old Flo was a strong mother, always bringing her daughter and son. As I watched, I learned one of the coolest things of all. One day, I saw David Graybeard stripping leaves from a twig, then sticking the twig into a termite mound. He wasn't just using the twig as a tool, he had made that tool. Before that, scientists thought only humans could make tools. There was no doubt now that these animals were intelligent. Every night, I'd write in my journal about what I observed, and every day I saw the chimpanzees doing the same things we do, holding hands, tickling, kissing, even patting backs to reassure each other. The more I observed, the more I learned. Soon, I had so much information, I needed a tape recorder. Then, I needed an assistant to help observe all the other chimpanzee families in the forest. Six years later, what started with a notepad and binoculars became a full research center. Now I was the one in charge. Isn't it wonderful? Look what we can build together. Today, thanks to our work in Tanzania, the whole world knows that animals have their own personalities and complex relationships. In my life, people told me there was a certain way to do things, a certain way to study animals, a certain way that girls should behave. They told me to follow the rules. Instead, I followed my gut. In your life, it will be easy to see how others are different from you, but there's so much more to gain if you instead, instead see how alike we all are. All of us, all living things, share so much. We have so many things in common. When we realize that and look out for each other, that's the most beautiful way to live together. Today, Dr. Goodall's work has grown, reminding people everywhere that we all share this earth every day. When we protect the planet, we protect each other. Even now, along with the Jane Goodall Institute, she's working to save endangered species, including her beloved chimpanzees, while also taking care of our environment. With more than 150,000 groups of young people in 130 plus countries, the Roots and Shoots Network connects youth, youth of all ages who share a desire to create a better world. And you can give them a call. You can be an environmentalist too. You can actually join. Their website is rootsandshoots.org. Want to work with animals one day? Watch your favorite animals and see what they do. Make notes. Read books about them. They're so much like us. I am Jane Goodall, and I see so much that we have in common. Watch, observe, 
be patient. I'll teach you this. We don't own this earth. We share it. Listen to the feelings in your heart. We are responsible for the animals around us. We must take care of them. When one of us is in trouble, be it human, creature, or nature itself, we must reach out and help. When we do, we build a bridge, a bridge that will carry all of us. The end. So that was I Am Jane Goodall. And remember, Jane is a real person. The book was told in her voice. That's why it says I a lot. And at the beginning of the video, I asked you to do two things. Write down all Jane's amazing discoveries about chimpanzees. And please, if you can type yourself or with the help of a parent, tell us in the comments what you discovered. And the other thing to do, I asked you to do was to think about ways you could build a bridge, how you could come together within your community and your family and think about ways you could help the planet or each other. And really, in doing those two things, you're doing both together. Um, so think about that today. Think about ways you could help them make, help the earth be a better place. Think about ways you could make it a safer place, a cleaner place. And you can post those in the comments too. We'd love to hear your ideas. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next week on Rosie Reads. Bye guys.